Hello, I wanted to welcome you to my new teaching company course on books that have made history, books that can change your life. Our subject is great books, books that over the course of time have proved their ability to speak to generation after generation and to individuals. And it's on that aspect that I want to focus in this course. That is to say, I have chosen books that I believe can still speak to each of us as an individual and can give us values and lessons by which we continue to live our lives. To set the stage for that, I would like you to shift your eyes back and your mind back to a different time and a different place. Forget that you are here in comfort, in a nation of prosperity, in a troubled time, but a time in which the troubles seem very minor compared to that of the year 1945. For I'd like you to look back to April the 9th, 1945, to Germany, to a Germany that is on the verge of total defeat. The Allied artillery rumbles throughout the western part of Germany, and in the east the Russians have closed their circle around the city of Berlin. But Adolf Hitler is still alive. And in these last days of a Germany that he has led to total ruin, the killing machine that this man has set up, this man whom Winston Churchill called the embodiment of evil, this killing machine still goes on. And a few days before, Hitler has met with Heinrich Himmler, and a list has been drawn up of prisoners who must die must die before this war comes to an end. Among these is a Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. On April the 9th, in a cold, dank cell in the little town of Flossenburg in the south of Germany, in an extermination camp, two evil men appear and say simply, Gefangene Bonhoeffer mitkommen, prisoner Bonhoeffer, come along. And he is taken out, and in the gray morning of that Easter week, he is put to death, hanged. He is hanged as a traitor, a traitor to his nation, a traitor to his leader, to Adolf Hitler. One of those who saw him in those last days, an Englishman, Payne Best, who later wrote about this, who had been in prison throughout the war in Germany, described Pastor Bonhoeffer, as he called him, as a man unlike any he had, other known, he had ever known in his quiet calm. And never, said Payne Best, have I seen a man to whom God was so close. The last thing that Bonhoeffer did before he was led to the scaffold was to take his book of Plutarch, which had been the last book sent to him at his request, had written his name, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, on the front page, on the middle page, and on the back page. Now, you will know from my earlier courses for the teaching company, famous Greeks and famous Romans, of my tremendous admiration for Plutarch, who wrote his biographies of famous Greeks and Romans in order to give individuals the lessons to live their lives, to make them better as citizens and as individuals. So Bonhoeffer, quoting both the Bible and Plutarch, went to his end. Bonhoeffer was a man who was shaped by his knowledge of the great books. He had received a German classical education. He was born into a family of comfort. His father was a professor of psychology at the University of Berlin. Back in the days when professors had been the most respected members of German society, well paid, a house full of servants. Bonhoeffer had been born in 1906 and seemed destined for a career either in music, for he was a talented musician, in medicine, or perhaps in theology. And he chose the latter course, studying under some of the most distinguished theologians of the day, like the great von Harnack at the University of Berlin, all of them friends of his father. He wrote his dissertation, which received great approval, wrote what the Germans call his Habilitationsschrift, the writing that enabled him to teach at a university. But to many puzzlement of his parents and others, he chose not to go into the academic side of theology, but became a pastor, teaching in strange places like Barcelona, where he counseled foreign legionnaires who had escaped from the misery of the French Foreign Legion. 
and developing a broad interest in the ecumenical church movement. So he came to America, and in New York of 1939, when it was clear the developments that Germany was going to undergo could not be stopped, he was urged by American friends to stay on, to become a member of something like the World Council of Churches and to pursue his interest in safety in America. But he said no, in a way much like Socrates, deciding to go to what he knew might be danger and death. He sailed back to Germany and he said, again reminiscent of Socrates whom he so admired, as soon as I was on that boat, my spirit became quiet, for I knew what I was doing, what I was destined to do. That will be a theme running through our course, to find out what you are destined to do at any stage of your life. So he came back to Germany, and by 1942 became involved in the resistance movement. His brother-in-law was deeply involved in the resistance movement, and Bonhoeffer, making use of his connections through the ecumenical church movement, began to join those who had realized, even when the war was successful, that Hitler must be destroyed, that Hitler represented evil, and that the only way to stop this evil was for individuals to take actions which others would deem to be treason, but to place a belief in good above what many saw to be their duty to their country. After all, the Lutheran Church and Martin Luther himself had laid down this rule following St. Paul that the powers that be are ordained of God and that an evil ruler was sent to you by God as punishment. So later at Nuremberg, many would say and believe it, I only followed what God had told us to do. Well, Bonhoeffer knew the different. He knew the, very well that this was not true. He used his connections with the World Council of Churches and other organizations to make himself seemingly useful to the Gestapo. It was said that he could go out to various countries, like Switzerland, for example, go to Sweden, uh, correspond with English churchmen, and thereby gain information that would be helpful to the Gestapo in their operations. In other words, Bonhoeffer lied. And there are times Bonhoeffer believed when you must lie in order to achieve a greater good. But the game was up. On April the 5th, 1943, he was arrested. Very much the same time, his brother-in-law was also arrested. And for two years, he languished in various prisons under the tender ministrations of the Gestapo. He does not seem to have been brutally tortured, but he was subjected to degradation, to constant harassment, and to the torment of not knowing what his fate would be. For a trial was never set up for him. There was constant preparation, constant hope that a trial would come when there would be a closure to this, but nothing ever occurred. And in these days and months in prison, he wrote. He had to write under the eye of the censor. From time to time, his writings were stopped by force. But he wrote. And after the war, these were brought together by his friend, who had also been arrested, and brought out as letters and papers from prison. They joined the Apology of Socrates and the Crito, written by Plato, as powerful statements of the soul imprisoned, and how despite the cruelest of punishments and separation from family and all that made life seem worthwhile originally, the soul can continue to speak and books can continue to speak to you. Because from time to time Bonhoeffer was allowed to receive books. He read the Bible all the way through and took particular interest in the Gospel of Mark and in Job and in Exodus, which we will read in this course. He read the prison dialogues of Plato about Socrates, and he said how these works spoke to him with a new meaning, a new fervor in these years and time here in prison. In other words, they are books that can speak to you with a different voice at each time of your life. In times of the greatest trial, in times of the greatest triumph. In prison, he used this time to 
evaluate his conception of God. And he came up with a powerful new conception that continues to puzzle. A theology of the cross, he said. A theology of a world without God. Not that God does not exist, but that God has abandoned the world. That is the true meaning of the cross, Bonhoeffer said, and of Jesus' words in the Gospel of Mark. My God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? God has been driven out of the world, and the cross is a symbol of the powerlessness of God in the world. That is how Bonhoeffer came to grips with this question of evil, a question that will much concern us in this course. Why does evil flourish, and is there such a thing as evil? For many today would say there is no such thing as evil or no such thing as absolute good. Well, to Bonhoeffer and to many who lived through the Third Reich or the time of Stalin in Russia, these men, Stalin and Hitler, embodied true evil. So why does such evil flourish? Why can six million people be put to death for no other crime than being who they are? Are 20 million in the labor camps of Russia? How could that be possible? Bonhoeffer came to grips with this concept and believed that it is for the individual to take action and in that action find his own God. A Christianity without all the formulas of religion. A Christianity of the Christ who suffered just such evil. So it was with this faith, with this use of the great books and his thought and contemplation that Bonhoeffer found the means to deal with this profound crisis of his own life and to go to his death with such calm certainty. Death, he said, is but the final step to eternal freedom, the eternal liberation from the folly of the world, from the fools who make all this evil. In fact, Bonhoeffer believed, and this is something we might ponder as we go through life, that a fool is worse than an evil person. An evil person finally comes to his ruin, but the fool simply cannot be persuaded and allows this evil to go on and on and on. We start with Bonhoeffer because Dietrich Bonhoeffer had read the same books as those who tormented him. In his last days, von Herfer was tried by the SS judge, Otto Thorbeck. Now, Thorbeck was so committed to his duty that when he got his orders to go and carry out this trial of von Herfer in prison, he could only go so far on the train. Then the train ran out of fuel. So he got a bicycle and rode the last 20 kilometers so he could carry on that trial. Now, Thorbeck was a product of the same kind of classical education as Dietrich von Herfer. He had read Antigone by Sophocles, which we discussed in our famous Greeks. He had read the Iliad, read the Odyssey, which we discussed in famous Greeks, had read Polybius. Why, he had also read the Bible because religious education was part of the education in German classical schools, and he would have read it in Greek, the New Testament. So how did this one man, the SS judge, come to the conclusion that his duty insisted that he carry out trials that in his heart he had to know was wrong, were wrong. And why did Bonhoeffer come to a conclusion that made him in the eyes of this judge a traitor? Each one read those great books, but Bonhoeffer read them and understood them with a moral compass of absolute right and wrong. And Thorbrecht read them with the eyes of one who had come to believe there was no absolute right or absolute wrong. For you see, the great books themselves are no cure. It is the values that the great books teach that make them a means to live your life in a way that is good and useful or in a way that does great harm, that makes you, in other words, into a wise man or into a fool. It is in the hopes that we can gain some wisdom that I have developed this course and want to go through these great books with you. Our great books will take us from the third millennium B.C. all the way up to the 20th century. They will take us from the classical civilizations of China and India, Greece and Rome, 
the Europe of the Renaissance, the Europe of the 18th century, the Europe of Goethe, to the 19th century and on into the 20th century to works like All Quiet on the Western Front, that great novel of World War I and of the utter folly of what war is in the eyes of its author, Eric Maria Remarque. They will be books that embody central ideas of great periods of human history, of classical Greece, classical India and China, of the Renaissance, of the Middle Ages in the form of Dante's Divine Comedy, of the Enlightenment, and of the 19th and 20th century. They will be books that are chosen because of their intrinsic greatness, but also because I believe that these books can speak to each one of us today. They are certainly books that have spoken to me. And this is a personal course, a course in which I have chosen for you books that have spoken to me over the course of my life and that I find when I go back to. Continue to speak to me, but in new ways, saying new things to me as I look in them for new experiences that my own life experiences have brought to my conscience. Our books will be arranged around themes. It is not a bare chronological survey that interests us, not a mere description of what is in a book, and certainly not literary theory, an attempt to apply modern techniques of deconstructing a text. No, we are interested in what the author says and in the themes of the author. And these are themes, I believe, that every thoughtful person must consider. And I believe, in fact, every person makes a decision about these themes, either to accept them or to reject them or not even to think about them. But the very act of not thinking about them is to make a decision. The first theme is God. Does God exist? Every civilization has made its decision, and in most of those classical civilizations, God has been seen as the primary mover of human action. Whether they are polytheists, believing in many gods, or monotheists. And we will examine great books of polytheism, such as the Iliad, and great books of monotheism, such as Exodus, the Gospel of Mark, and the Quran. Then, having thought about whether God exists, the next question is about fate. Do things happen by chance, or is there a plan? Marcus Aurelius, whose meditations we will study, says it doesn't matter whether you believe in God or not, you still come back to the question, is everything chance or is it a plan? Just random occurrences in your life like a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing, or is there some meaning to your life? And with that, good and evil. Is there absolute good? Is there absolute evil? Do we make decisions to do actions based upon some absolute good? Or is it all just a matter of chance and circumstances? In other words, is it always right to tell a lie? Or always wrong to tell a lie? After all, Dietrich Bonhoeffer would have believed in absolute right. And yet he believed there were circumstances in which he had to lie. And I say, is it always right to tell a lie? Because there are many of us who go through life lying all the time. And only from time to time telling the truth when we're forced to. There are even politicians who might build their lives upon that kind of ability to lie. After all, in the Odyssey, Homer praises Odysseus as a man who knew how to tell many lies and to tell them well. God, fate, good and evil. And having made decisions about these fundamental themes, we ask ourselves, how then do we live? How do we shape our lives? And do these great books give us a means of learning the meaning of our life? Because that is one of the great questions Again, we face whether we actively say, what is the meaning to my life, or whether we just go through life without ever asking the question. 
But at the end of our days, we will be like Marcus Aurelius, realizing that our bodies will dissolve into atoms and asking, what have we done? And that is a question perhaps to ask yourself more when you are 20 than when you are 60, to give a shape and meaning to what you do, to the career that you choose. But at any time in your life, you can step back and say, what meaning does any of this have? The meaning of life. And with that, the question of truth. Do we live our life by truth and questions of good? Or do we once again build our whole life upon a fabric of lies? Duty and responsibility, that is a central theme for us as we go through life. What is our duty? For you see, Otto Thorbeck, the SS judge, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, coming from the same tradition, both being Lutherans, come to the very radical conclusions about duty. For Bonhoeffer, it was to follow the higher calling of good no matter what. And for Thorbeck, it was to follow orders. And how many times in our lives in a corporation or in the academic world do we take comfort in that notion that we're just following orders? We're just doing what we have to do to survive. And from duty and responsibility come our ideas about justice, about government, about society, and what kind of society we want, what kind of government do we want, and do we want a government that is built upon lies, as was the Third Reich of Hitler, evil lies. And bridging this gap is love. Every one of us comes to grips with the question of love, romantic love. Why, in fact, while he was in prison, Bonhoeffer got engaged. That was his positive statement that life would go on. So we'll talk about romantic love, and I hope none of you's soul is so dead that you have not at least once in your life been absolutely, desperately in love with somebody willing to do anything. And love, like all of our themes, is a matter of courage and honor and ambition. Courage and honor and ambition, these run through some of the greatest of books, like the Iliad, like the Gospel of Mark, like the story of Faust struggling to know all that is. So courage and honor and ambition, and with them, beauty and nature. These are books that speak to what is inside us, what we could call the soul, if we want to make that decision as we go through our reading, beauty. Absolute standards of beauty, and with it, the beauty of nature. Henry David Thoreau will speak to us about how ultimately our soul must commune with the beauty of nature. He had read the Iliad, he had read the Odyssey, but the Iliad lay unread on his table at Walden Pond. It was the Bhagavad Gita the great song of God from classical India that made him understand that God was imminent in all of nature and that the natural scientist was as close to God, perhaps closer, than the theologian. Beauty is what is around us now and history is our sense of the past. And these great books are our links with the great ideas of the past. We see our course is built upon the belief, just like our course on Winston Churchill or our course on a history of freedom or on famous Greeks and Romans, that great books, great ideas, and great individuals make history. That's not a popular notion today and certainly not in the academic world. In the academic world, we like to think that it is anonymous social and economic forces that make history. Slavery, for example, is the great object of study for those who ponder the lessons of the ancient world. Well, they're wrong. Karl Marx, who is the intellectual father of this notion that social and economic forces make great ideas, was wrong. It is the great ideas that propel men and women to become great in themselves. It was a great idea of truth that made Bonhoeffer into a great man. It was a great idea of truth that made Socrates and the great idea of God and of conscience that made Socrates into a great man and left those sophists, those academics, those professors of his day trailing in the dustbin of history. The great ideas and those great individuals, whether a Napoleon 
or an Abraham Lincoln who build upon those ideas of liberty and equality or of government of the people, by the people, and for the people that bring the world into a new age of grandeur. So we will be tied to history, and every one of us ultimately makes the decision to be aware of the historical past, to draw lessons from it, or to dismiss it as irrelevant. And I fear that we live today in an ahistorical age in which we believe that we are so wise that we no longer need the lessons of the past, and perhaps most disturbingly of all, that technology has put us beyond the lessons of the past. Technology makes us immune to the forces of history. So I'll ask my class the question. We'll be talking about the Hittites, for example. Do you believe that someday, 3,000 years from now, a professor will be talking to a group of students about the Americans and say, uh, oh, the Americans, you know, there's the city of New York, the way that that was the Hittite capital of Bogot's Curie. And someone will raise their hand and say, but professor, we're going to have to know about the Americans on the test because there's only one lecture on them on the syllabus. And I ask them that and almost none of them will put up their hands because America, of course, will always endure just as the Roman emperors celebrated Rome as the eternal empire. Well, it won't be true. History will be our judge. And history will say how well we have learned these values from the great books. So the past and the lessons of the past, these all come together to educate us. But that is the ultimate goal of a course in the great books, is wisdom. We'll certainly begin with information. There's plenty of information out in the world today. The Internet is filled with information overwhelming us. And you can take that information and weave it together and come up with some knowledge. Knowledge is what you would have at the end of this course. From what I have told you about these great books, you don't have knowledge about them. But it's for you to take that final step to transform information and knowledge into wisdom. And wisdom really only comes about through meditation, through contemplation. Bonhoeffer came to that conclusion as well in prison, to contemplate, just like Socrates. And that wisdom is the ability to put the lessons of the great books into use in your own life, to apply them to live your life. So our course is a course that I hope will have as its ultimate goal to make each of us wiser to give each of us some wisdom, to give each of us insight into these great books, and to allow some of these great books to speak to each one of us. I have used the term great book again and again in this first lecture. What is a great book? It is a book that has a great theme. It is a book that has a language that is noble. And it is a book that can speak across the ages. A great theme. Not some petty discussion that you would find in a comic book. Not some sound bite from CNN. But a theme that speaks across the ages, such as Bonhoeffer. Of the man imprisoned for his conscience and goes to death because he knows in his conscience that he is right. And his simple spare German, why it embodies the notion of a noble language. Any language can be noble. But in that language, a great book has the ability to elevate and ennoble. Hemingway can be as noble as the Iliad. One in spare poetry, one in spare prose. And finally... It must speak across the ages. We must be able to hold the Iliad in our hand 2,800 years after Homer composed it and say, yes, this has meaning for me right now. And it is, enables me to read it, to understand it, and it educates me for true freedom 
which is the freedom to live my life in a responsible fashion. Well, I look forward to this course and to going through these great books and learning from them with you.